All right, thank you all for stopping by. I'm gonna go ahead and get started today. So uh, my name is Gillen Brown. I'm a grad student here at the University of Michigan in the Department of Astronomy. So I'm gonna be talking about all kinds of stuff astronomy related today, but I'm gonna start with the Earth because here on Earth there's all kinds of things. And one thing we're gonna talk about is what different things are made of. It's a kind of an interesting question that we'll talk about more later, but I wanna start with two things. So I'm gonna have this side of the room I want you to talk about what water is made of and what gold is made of. You might know the answers to these. And then this side of the room, I'm going to have you talk about air and then aluminum foil. So talk amongst yourselves for like 10 seconds, 30 seconds. And then I'll ask you if you have any ideas here in just a second. So Water? Water, yeah. Oh, oh. you get to use the mic. Whoever wants to. It's made of hydrogen and oxygen. Cool. What about gold? It's made of gold. Made of gold, oxen. That's a trick question. All right. Now, you all, do you have an idea of what's in air? Anyone want to volunteer? Oxygen. Oxygen? You say it into the microphone. Oxygen. Awesome. That's true. You know anything else that's in there? There's all kinds of stuff. Water. Cool. So, yeah, those are all great answers. And kind of, oh, did you talk about aluminum foil, too? Do you know what's in aluminum foil? That's also a trick question. Minerals. Say that again? Minerals. Minerals. Okay, good. That's true. You guys know? What's in aluminum foil? Yeah. Aluminium. Aluminium. Exactly. Aluminum is made of aluminum. So kind of the point of this is that some things are made of other things. Like air, it has all kinds of stuff in it. But some things like gold are just, they're not made of anything more. They're just what they are. And so... What we can do as scientists is make a list of all the things that are what they are, like all the things that are like gold or like aluminum that we can break other things down into. And so we can do that, and it turns out that we can put our list into a big table like this, where this is a list of all the elements, we, we call them elements, that different things are made of. So I see you pointing out some things. I'm going to point some out too. And that this water that we talked about, it's made of hydrogen, which is the number one in the very top left and oxygen, which is number eight here. So water is just two of these things. You put them together and you get water. Air is a mixture of all these other things. So we said water vapor. So that's, you get your hydrogen, your oxygen, you get some oxygen. There's also things like carbon dioxide. So that is that C and the O. And then there's lots of nitrogen in the air too. Most of the air is actually nitrogen, this element N up there. And then there's also a little bit of argon which is another gas that you may not hear about that I didn't realize was in the top five or six, but it is. And there's all kinds of other stuff too that I didn't put on here, but this is just some of the few things that are in air that we can break it down into. While gold is uh, number 79 here, it has a weird symbol, AU, it's a, some Latin name. And then uh, aluminum, it's its own thing also, number 13 up there. And so the idea behind this is that you can break things down into similar things uh, things that can't be broken down any further that we call elements. And so with all these elements, the question that I'm kind of asking in this talk is one that you may not even think to ask, and that's where did these elements come from? If we have aluminum or we have gold, how do we get that gold in the first place? Where did it come from? So as an astronomer, what I can do, or other astronomers can do more accurately, is to look at the very beginning of the universe, to see what was around when the universe started, right after the Big Bang. So we know how that worked. We can do the math and figure out what elements there were. And it turns out there were only these first two. There was only hydrogen that was in part of water and helium, so balloons. So we could have had balloons after the beginning of the universe, but basically nothing else. We couldn't have air, right? We don't have oxygen. We couldn't have aluminum or gold. So these had to be made somehow throughout the history of the universe. And so how does this happen? Well, it turns out galaxies are a big part of this. And this is kind of what I want to talk about next. So galaxies are beautiful things. They have, there's these spiral galaxies. There's several examples here I'm going to show. But there's a huge variety of galaxies. So they have different colors from one another, slightly different shapes. There's a ton of these beautiful spiral galaxies. I could show a million pictures of these, and I have quite a few here. But you can also notice the different colors. Some of these are because of the way the picture was taken. But galaxies really are different colors from each other. You have some that are different shapes. This one's a little more fuzzy in the center than some of the other ones were. Then you have some like this that are just basically a big ball of stars without these nice, pretty spiral arms like other galaxies have. 
Some of them have these like shells around them almost. A bunch of weird shapes that galaxies can have. You have ring-shaped galaxies. Really, the, the variety of galaxies is endless. But I want to kind of transition into what galaxies are made of. So we talked about what stuff on Earth is made of. And what we can do to look at galaxies is to zoom in on them. So this is a picture of uh, a nearby galaxy. This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the closest big galaxy to us in the Milky Way. Um, and this is a picture of it taken with the telescope on the ground, like the one there on the left. And we're going to zoom in on it as far as we can. And you can see that it starts to get blurry. You can't really see as much as we might like. And that's because we're on the ground. There's the air between us and the stars, and it basically blurs out the image. So what we can do to fix that is to go to a space telescope like Hubble Space Telescope. You might have heard of that. And it can see a whole lot more than telescopes on the ground. You can see them in much sharper vision. And so we zoom in, and the closer we get here, you'll start to see that what was kind of a fuzz earlier is actually a ton of individual stars like our sun. And even though stars are like our sun, you can see there's a variety of stars too. Some are red, some are blue. I'm going to pause this real quick. But you can see some red stars, some blue stars, some are brighter or fainter than others. So there's a huge variety of stars that exist in galaxies, but really galaxies are made of stars. And stars do all kinds of interesting things. So stars have their own life cycle, kind of like humans do, in that they are born and then they die. And so we're going to walk through all this whole life cycle here because it tells us about how elements form, which is kind of the goal of our talk here. But I want to start with this how stars form in the first place. So they form in these things that we call a nebula. It's basically a big cloud. These are a couple of examples you might have seen before, where it's a bunch of hydrogen gas, basically, that has gravity that's basically pulling it together. And in some spots, if you look really closely with Hubble Space Telescope, you can see these little stars are about to form, these little tiny clumps. So here are some more examples. This big cloud is made up of little smaller clouds. These are all individual stars as they're about to form. So gravity turns this giant cloud, this beautiful, into these individual stars. And so you get stars out of this process. And on this diagram, we basically split them into small stars like our sun. Even though our sun is huge compared to the Earth, it's smaller compared to other stars out there and big stars. And we'll go through these both because they're both super interesting, but let's start with stars like our sun because that's what we're most familiar with. So the sun shines. It gives us light. It lets us live. But the sun is powered by this thing we call nuclear fusion, where you're basically taking elements and smashing them together. So in the center of their sun, there's lots of this element we talked about earlier called hydrogen. And if you take a bunch of hydrogen and smash it together really hard, harder than you could possibly do, as a human, you can turn it into the next element called helium. And so this is happening in the sun right now. It's taking hydrogen, smashing it together, and making helium. And that's how the sun shines. It's doing this releases a bunch of energy that the sun can use to give us light. And so the sun will do this for like 10 billion years. And then once it's done, it basically runs out of hydrogen. It'll do another thing where it takes three heliums, smashes those together, and you can get carbon, another atom on this table that we talked about too. So this powers the sun for a while. And what's interesting is that we took hydrogen that was around at the beginning of the universe and we turned it into carbon, which was not. So this process of stars powering themselves is how you get all these other elements that are out there in the universe. So once these stars, the sun runs out of energy at the end of its life, um, it goes through this thing that we call a red giant. It basically becomes super huge, even by star standards. It'll get so large, it'll eat several of the planets, possibly Earth for example. So it gets big and then it basically gets way too big and it puffs off all the outer layers. So it loses its, uh, all the material that it had. And so when you do this, you get beautiful things like this. These are some stars that are undergoing this process right now where they're taking the material that they made, like this carbon, and putting it back out into the universe. And so if we look at our diagram again, you can see that these, this process that we call planetary nebula this material can go back into a star-forming nebula for future generations of stars to be made of. So the carbon that one star makes can be used by another star to maybe seed life on one of its planets, for example. And you'll also notice this little thing at the bottom called a white dwarf. If you look in the center of each of these images, you can see a little dot, a bright one there, there, and it's hard to see, but 
here or there. It looks like there might be two, but each of these is a tiny little leftover star that we call a white dwarf. And we'll talk about those a little later too, but they're very interesting in their own right. But that's basically how stars like our sun live their lives. They take hydrogen, put it into helium, and then to carbon that they can then put out into the universe for other things to use. So next we'll talk about big stars. As you might imagine, big stars can do a lot more fusion than our sun can because they're bigger, they have more gravity basically. So for example, they can do the same stuff our sun did, but then they can keep going. So they can take carbon, they'll smash it together with helium and you can make oxygen. Oxygen's a, obviously a very important element that we need to breathe and for water and all that stuff. So we couldn't live without oxygen and it's made in these big stars. And then it, it does this a bunch of times. I'm not going to show all the things that happen, but one that happens at the end that's super interesting is that you take this element called chromium, which is a very big element, put it with the helium, and you get iron. Iron's an important one, and it's special in stars because iron is as far as you can go. Normally, stars give, normally this process gives off energy, but once you get to iron, that stops happening. So your star can't shine anymore. It basically collapses and then explodes. So you get this thing that we call supernova, which is when a star blows up. And so it takes all the elements it created, like chromium and oxygen and iron, and it spews them out into the universe for, again, future generations of stars to use. And it leaves behind these things that are, I think I highlighted them here. Oh, yeah, so it does this. They have these huge remnants of supernova left behind um, for future generations of stars to use. And there is a bit of a, there's a star in the center of each of these. It's too hard to see. These stars are even smaller than white dwarfs. These are the neutron stars. There might be black holes that are left behind by supernova too. So supernova are very interesting because you get all kinds of cool stuff out of them. All right, so that's most of the ways that we get elements. There's one more I want to talk about, and that involves these last couple things, the, the leftovers of stars, these neutron stars or white dwarfs. And sometimes these can run into each other. So what two white dwarfs can collide with each other or two neutron stars can collide. It, oh, it looks something like this, these huge explosions. We've seen these things happen, so we know this really does happen. This is obviously a, an artist drawing of what this might look like, but we can observe this happening and these leave behind their own remnants too. And these things, like any other, are full of new elements that are created in the explosions that were not present beforehand. So you can create elements in these type of things too. And so with that, we can fill in the periodic table based on where these elements come from. So the yellow here, the elements in yellow were made by these big stars as they lived their lives and then blew up. Um, the blue ones are stars like our sun. So they made a few elements plus some other ones by another thing that I didn't talk about. And then these other green elements are these merging neutron stars that I talked about. And similarly, the orange is these white dwarfs when they merge and explode. So to go back to what we talked about at the beginning, uh, we talked about water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. So hydrogen was one of the elements that was around since the beginning of the universe. It was made in the Big Bang. And then oxygen was made in stars as they explode at the end of their lives, these big stars. Uh, air, we have hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, argon. These are made, hydrogen in the Big Bang. Carbon and nitrogen, those are essential to life. So carbon is what we're mostly made of. It was mostly made in stars like our sun with a little bit from these big stars. Similar with oxygen, or sorry, nitrogen. And then argon, another part of the air that's like 1%, I think. Um, it comes from these big stars and a little bit from these exploding white dwarfs. Um, gold, gold is obviously nice element, jewelry, coins, etc. Those comes from these two neutron stars as they collided. So if you have a piece of gold jewelry, that's a leftover of two stars as they collided and blew up. And that's really cool to me, that you, you have something that is a remnant of something that happened in space. And our whole bodies are really made of things that happen in space. So we ha we're really connected to the universe in a way that you might not have thought of before. And then our last one, aluminum, it was another one that's made in these big stars. So big stars are really super important for a lot of what happens in the universe. And this kind of ties into what I do as an astronomer. I am interested in how elements are put into galaxies and where they are in galaxies. And one that we use a lot in astronomy is oxygen. We've talked about oxygen quite a bit. This is element number eight. 
And one thing that we can observe about galaxies is something like this. So this is a little diagram that I made. So on the left, we have a small galaxy. On the right, we have a big galaxy. And I put a false color on here to basically color code the amount of oxygen at each point in the galaxy. So red means there's a lot of oxygen at this point. Blue means there's not a lot of oxygen at this point. And so there's a couple things you might notice about this. Anyone want to volunteer anything they see happening? Yes. Let me get a microphone. The red presents more oxygen. Good. Which and, is the and which, galaxy. yes, and which galaxy has more? The big galaxy. The big galaxy, exactly. Awesome. So the big galaxies have more oxygen than small galaxies. Why is this the case? We don't really know. There's, we can do a lot about it, but it's still an open question. Um, what about like the center of the galaxy compared to the outside? And then the center of each galaxy has more oxygen than the outside as well. So if you look, on the big galaxy, for example, it's, it's red in the center and kind of fades to bluish on the outside. And so this is a thing that we can observe. The center of galaxies have more oxygen on the outside. Why is this the case? It's not easy to think about how this would happen. And so what I do is run computer simulations of galaxies. So this is an example. Uh, this is not my movie. It's a movie someone else made. It's beautiful, though, which I like to use it. So what you basically do is put all the rules you know about how galaxies form into a computer. So we know gravity is important. We know that stars form. We know that galaxies merge, all these things. And when you do this, you put them in the computer and have it solve all these equations. And you can get out a galaxy that's pretty realistic in a lot of ways. So here we're flying through a galaxy to look at it as it spins around, basically. And so what's nice about these computer simulations is that we can't observe this in real life. This takes millions and billions of years to take to do this process. But in a computer, you can look at it in a movie in 30 seconds like this. And so we can really see how galaxies change over time in a way that we can't otherwise. And we can use this to learn about how galaxies formed. So I'll play this again here. And so this is what I do. I basically put oxygen into these simulations, tell it track how much there is, and then we can compare to the, the real galaxies we observe to see if our answers are right or not about how we think this happens, and then we can learn about the processes that make more oxygen be in the center than the outsides, for example, or um, big galaxies to have more oxygen than small galaxies. These are the kind of questions we're asking by doing these computer simulations. So once this finishes, I will leave it here, and I will take any more questions. Thank you all.